Okay, welcome back to the channel. Another catch and cook. But first, just some quick housekeeping. Both the OG and Dirty Jersey Blades are back in stock on the website, cookingandfishing.com. I'm seeing more and more bait in our water now that the month-long south wind streak is finally over, thank God. And with this full moon, once the peanut bunker are in thick, that's when you want to fully utilize the extra flash and vibration of the spinner blades. So this trip lasted about two hours and most of it was a dink fest until I came across this patch of fish. Now it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes you have no choice but to weed through the shorts for keepers. But sometimes you make a little wiggle along the beach and definitely come across a better quality class of fish. Now that fish came off my default tight line jigging with the silver blade, but later on I'll switch to the quicker free fall jigging and lose the spinner blade. Now the blade is just a tool. What's more important is picking the right jigging technique that matches the conditions and mood of the fish. The minutia of how to control your jig and make it do exactly what you want it to do is covered in the single jigging virtual lesson on the website. Something I plan on adding to and expanding upon over the winter. Here I'm using the 5 inch mullet, same quarter ounce gammy jig head, and letting it free fall after popping it high off the bottom. Switching between the methodical gliding action of the tight lining method to the much more erratic free falling jig has served me well, especially this year. It's definitely been a strange season so far. My short to keeper ratio has skewed one way or another seemingly on every trip. For a few weeks there I had more keepers than shorts and my average fish was pushing 22 inches. Then there were many trips where it was literally 20 plus shorts for every keeper. Now both scenarios are somewhat alarming and I'm hoping the weird patterns this year is indeed attributable to the relentless south winds and upwelling because the alternatives are much more depressing. Okay, once again I'm using my Steve's AGS paired to the Vanquish. I'm trying to use the new twin power more, but it's hard to put this combo down when I'm fluke jigging. As usual, I'll leave all the gear in the description below, along with rod and reel combos for every budget. This is the kind of fishing where having the right gear makes all the difference in the world. So the cooking really starts at the beach, taking care of your catch, bleeding them out thoroughly, and getting the fish on ice immediately. These steps will have enormous impact on your final product. Okay, we're going to roast this fluke, but we're going to do it the easiest way I know how. No scaling involved here, which is a godsend since fluke have very tiny, tightly packed scales that are difficult to remove. Now we are removing the gills and guts, obviously, but keeping the rest of the fish intact. 
Make sure you remove the bloodline and rinse thoroughly. And this fish was feeding on crabs, even though there were some bait fish in the wash. There's, there's more and more coming in with this full moon, but as of now, crabs are still a big part of their diet. Okay, once you have the fish prepped, just pat it dry with paper towels and set it aside. And now we're going to make the mies for our lemon caper butter sauce. Very French bistro, southern France flavor profile here, but the main point of this dish is roasting the fish whole on the bone. There's really only two ways to cook fluke. On the bone like we're doing here in this video, or filleted and breaded or battered and fried. The third way is raw preps like crudo or ceviche, but fluke has very little fat content and any recipe that calls for fillets without protecting it with batter or breading is asking for a high degree of technical execution from most home cooks. Now roasting it on the bone increases your window dramatically and keeping the skin on further keeps things moist while cooking. So brunoise shallots roughly chopped capers. Capers you have to rinse very thoroughly. They're very salty and when you taste for seasoning you really have to take into account the amount of capers you added to your dish. And roughly chopped flat leaf parsley, always flat leaf. There's, there's really no reason to ever use curly parsley if you can even find it these days. So here I'm cutting out a few lemon suprems. This is optional. You can just use the juice, but I like a few random nuggets of lemon pulp in the sauce for that burst of citrus. Now if all this is too much prep for you already, a simple vinaigrette made from lemon juice and good extra virgin olive oil is really all you need to pour over the fish after it's roasted. The main thing here is having the freshest possible fish cooked perfectly. Okay, mincing garlic. 99% of the time, you must crush your garlic prior to mincing. So crushing it with the flat of your knife or some other tool. Then a relatively fine mince, and we're going to brown this garlic along with the butter and take it pretty far in the pan later on. Okay, so here's your mise en place for the dish. Um, lemon juice, capers, shallots, parsley, and a whole lot of garlic. But don't worry, that garlic is going to become very sweet. It's, it's not going to be harsh at all because we're going to cook it for a good five minutes in butter. Now back to the fish. I'm going to rub some vegetable oil. Use any kind of oil you want. The oven is preheated to 500 degrees, right? So very hot oven. There's almost no time where you want to roast fish at a lower temperature. So any recipe that calls for 375, 400 is basically wrong. Roasting whole fish or even fillets is almost always 450 or above, as high as the oven can go without putting it on the broil setting. So here is about three and a half minutes after the fish went in and you see the skin is basically crackling. And we're using a meat thermometer. This is about seven minutes. And I've rotated the fish, all right, 131, 132. I was shooting for 128. So at the thickest portion near the bone, if it's reading anywhere over 128 to 135, you're good. It's going to carry over the 145 plus easily after you rest it for five to 10 minutes. Look at that, it just came right off, Paul. That's what we wanted. Look at that. That's nice. So yeah, I'm pretty excited about the skin just peeling off. I've never roasted a fish without scaling it before, and my fear was the skin would stick to the meat and be a pain to remove. I think that's still a possibility if you roast your fish at too low a temperature, but seven to eight minutes at 500 degrees, beautiful. That's exactly what I was looking for. Something easy that takes as little time and effort as possible because I might just be the world's laziest cook. Okay, while the fish is resting, we're gonna start the butter sauce. Now, obviously you need butter. Now that's a whole stick of butter, it's unsalted. Right after the butter melts, the garlic is going to go in. So I'm going to start the garlic and shallots while the butter is relatively cold. This way they will start the gentle browning process along with the butter. Pinch of salt to get the moisture moving, but remember, easy on the seasoning considering the amount of capers in this sauce. 
Now conversely, if you took the option of a vinaigrette, you're going to use more salt than you normally would for dressing a salad. Since the one drawback of roasting the fish the way we did is there was no chance to season the meat of the fish prior to cooking. So whatever sauce you end up serving it with needs to be somewhat over seasoned to compensate, including this one and whatever vinaigrette you lazier bums and even myself choose to make instead. So we're about five to six minutes in over medium heat. Now you need to pay attention to the color of both your mirepoix and the butter itself. Have good lighting so you can keep track of it. Now brown butter is good, burnt butter is garbage. So once everything is not brown, you pour in your lemon juice to stop the cooking. Now after that, off the heat, your chopped parsley goes in, mix it around, and the cooking is pretty much done. Burn noisette. Okay, so the sauce is done. We're going to taste and adjust seasoning. And like I said, the seasoning here is a little bit tricky. Normally, if you're serving this sauce with a filet or a chicken cutlet, that meat was seasoned prior to cooking. But in this dish, zero salt has touched the fish. So all your seasoning comes from this sauce and therefore it should be roughly 30 to 40% saltier to compensate for the unseasoned fish. I hope that makes sense. Now here is sort of a nerve wracking process. We're going to transfer the fish from the roasting pan to the plate. Now if your fish falls apart, do not panic. Just get it on the plate and then you can put it together like a jigsaw puzzle. It's happened to me plenty of times before under very high stress situations and if you panic, things end up on the floor, things end up falling apart even more. Okay, once you plate your fish perfectly, you can begin the sauce. Now here, I made a mistake by using up all my sauce in one go. Remember, once the top side is consumed, you'll remove the spine and you have another half of the fish with no sauce to accompany it. So we may do, but do reserve 40% of that sauce for the white side meat. And this dish came out beautifully, and I must say, it was cooked perfectly. Like I said, I pulled it at 131 Fahrenheit, which was what the meat thermometer showed. I think the window could be anywhere from 128 to 135, and you will get excellent results. Now, if you were to pan fry a piece of fluke filet, um, your window there is probably five to 10 seconds, right? Fluke, again, has no fat whatsoever. So it's a very technical dish to get right if you don't have the benefit of cooking it on the bone or protecting it with breading or batter. Okay, hope you guys enjoy the return of some catch and cooks on this channel. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you guys on the next one.